How's that for a start to a good service? Great start. Great start. Thank you, Deb. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome. Good morning. Welcome back from Disney World. Did it go to Disney World or Disneyland? Disneyland. All right. Well, welcome back. I, I'm surprised you decided to come back and not live there. A lot of people live in Disneyland, you know. <laughs> well, welcome to one and all. One of, uh, welcome, I should say. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Spokane. I always like to get our mission statement out there in the mornings because it's something we started doing several years ago, and I think it really helps us remember who we are, what we're about, or at least what we strive to be about. So our mission statement is, we join together to create a nourishing, liberal, religious home to champion justice, diversity, and environmental stewardship in our wider world. And to make it even easier, we shortened it to just those three points I ask you to repeat with me, to create community, find meaning, and work for justice. Sometimes I like to talk about the history of, of these opening words because they're the same every Sunday. And, and it can sound very ritualistic, right? Like, like we're just repeating them by rote, but, but I'm not. I'm, I'm always repeating these words with, with meaning. They're coming from me uh, with great appreciation for their content and the context in which they were created. So every now and then I'll just stop and say that, like I did today, okay? Because this mission statement is beautifully thought out and beautifully put. As is our intentional way of welcoming everyone, by embracing all that you bring with you, all of your uniqueness, your unique beliefs, your background, your lifestyle, your experiences, your differences, all that helps make you who you are is welcome here this morning. So thanks to everyone for being here, those of you who are in the room with us, as well as those who are streaming with us, it's, uh, it's great to have you with us as well. Incidentally, uh, we've started sort of a pilot program, our first service where uh, there's also a Zoom room open for folks who want to Zoom live with us. When you're streaming, there's about a 30-second delay, so you'll hear this in just a few seconds. <laughs> Wait for you to catch up. And if you're Zooming, actually, it, 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 there's some opportunity for some interaction, particularly during, during the service. So it was nice to have a few folks up here and being able to speak with us and, and back and forth and whatnot. Folks, folks from, what's that? Oh, we've got some folks with, oh, we've got some folks Zooming with us. Second service, too. Wonderful. Welcome. Good to have you guys. Uh, are, are there mics open? Are there mics on? There are, no. So would you mind introducing yourselves and telling us where you're from? We're John and Ray Smith from the Unitarian Church of Vancouver. That's British Columbia, not Washington. <laughs> Wonderful. And I see a familiar face with us as well. I'm Catherine de la Vigne, and I'm from Spokane Valley, and I'm home today, so I thought I would try. Wonderful. Well, I, I'm glad the, the, the room is open. There's no host, so, you know, hopefully uh, you guys will behave and no one has to get kicked out. <laughs> We'll do our best. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, thank you for being here. Wonderful to have you. And, and maybe there'll be an opportunity uh, to hear from you in a little, little bit in our service as well. So this is something we're, we're exploring. And we really do. We, you know, one of the holdbacks for the second service is finding a regular host or two who could host that, host that Zoom meeting. But it's, it's, it gives folks an opportunity, as you saw, to, to be a little bit more interactive with us. So we're trying to make that happen, and then, and then as well as having their own uh, opportunity, and they're, they're still with us, their own opportunity to, uh, to visit with one another during sort of a social period following the service, and, and maybe even engage with some of us who want to take out a cell phone or whatever we work out to engage with. So we're kind of trying to bring in as much of our uh, digital community into our lives as possible. So this is a great first step, and I welcome everybody uh, whether you're here in person or streaming or Zooming with us this morning. So with that, all of that said, let's do take a few, a few seconds, not many, 
uh, to greet one another here in the room or online this morning. to break that up, but as always, there will be opportunity to visit more with one another during our social hour. So please do stay around for that. We are going to move forward with our service now by lighting our chalice. The chalice, as you hear me say each Sunday, is a symbol of our faith. It is a symbol of our unity and our solidarity. By the way, you want me to give you a little history on this too? Because you hear me say this every Sunday too, right? So when I first came here, we didn't actually have a chalice. This is a beautiful, beautiful chalice that was uh, uh, constructed by a fellow who uh, is no longer with us, but he did several of these for the Unitarian Universalist Association. And we had a group of members who hired him to do this and, and donate this. And so uh, we, did a, we did our first service with the chalice. Uh, chalice. Th this is what we use for our chalice. It's still here, it's still here, it's still that This was something that was donated to us by Harold Belays. Most of you know Harold, incredible artist and a member of our congregation. So this served kind of as our chalice, but we added this and we had a special service sort of inaugurating it. And I, I wanted some words that really reflected what the chalice means. So I, I wrote these words myself. And uh, we've been using them every Sunday ever since. Uh, initially it didn't have the last line about casting a shadow of doubt where truth has been found. So I added that later because I thought it, would, it felt incomplete if we didn't have that part, right? So, so th these words, I think, are... are uh, well, I shouldn't say they're magnificent because I wrote them, right? <laughs> but they really capture, I, for me, what we're supposed to be about. Okay, so I, I, I never... Again, I never say these just by rote as part of our ritual, but uh, with, with deep, deep meaning... Uh, of their origins and the thought and the heart that went into them and the meaning behind them. So, you ready? Oh, it's already lit. Okay, all right. <laughs> we have now lit our, our chalice, the symbol of our unity and our solidarity, of our openness and our inclusion, of our community and our individual uniqueness. May this flame be our offering of warmth to those who are cold and alone and a light to those in darkness. 
May it be a flame that ignites justice in our world and a beacon of hope to those in need. And may it reflect at least a spark of truth wherever truth is lost, period, is where it was. Then we add an and, cast a healthy shadow of doubt wherever it's been found. It's perhaps my favorite line. In our opening <coughs> reflection today, I wanted to recollect the character of our late congregant, Owen Meir. And there's this beautiful floral wreath in his memory here today. Uh, to recall his eccentricity, his hands-on involvement, his intelligence, his sociability. To my mind, his was a world filled with the quirkiness and the companionability of G.K. Chesterton's poem, The Rolling English Road. Before the Roman came to Rye or out to Severn strode, the rolling English drunkard made the rolling English road, a reeling road, a rolling road that rambles round the shire, and after him the parson ran, the sexton, and the squire. A merry road, a mazy road, and such as we did tread the night we went to Birmingham by way of Beachy Head. I knew no harm of Bonaparte and plenty of the squire. And for to fight the Frenchmen I did not much desire, but I did bash their bagonets because they came arrayed to straighten out the crooked road an English drunkard made. Where you and I went down the lane with ale mugs in our hands the night we went to Glastonbury by way of Beachy Sands. His sins, they were forgiven him. Or why do flowers run behind him in the hedges, all strengthening in the sun? The wild thing went from left to right and knew not which was which, but the wild rose was above him when they found him in the ditch. God pardon us, nor harden us. We did not see so clear the night we went to Bannockburn by way of Be Brighton Pier. My friends, we will not go again or ape an ancient rage, or stretch the folly of our youth to be the shame of age, but walk with clearer eyes and ears this path that wandereth, and see undrugged in evening light the decent inn of death. For there is good news yet to hear and fine things to be seen before we go to paradise by way of Kensal Green. I could, I could hear o about Owen in that. I really could. Thank you, Dave. It was wonderful. Um, we're going to sing something out of our turquoise hymnal, and we will have words on our screen, but uh, for those of you in the back, you might want to grab a turquoise hymnal if it's hard to see. Um, I want to say, though, that there's a long repeat in the middle of this, and I'm not doing that long repeat. When you get down to the bottom of page three, we just continue on. So... Please stand as you're willing and able to sing number 1051, We Are.
We are now going to kindle our candles of care for those who are most on our hearts and minds this morning. And we'll begin as we have been with a candle on behalf of the people of the Ukraine and that region of the world who are being most impacted by the, the unnecessary destruction and violence there. Let's take a moment of, usual moment of silence on behalf of others that you might be thinking of and as always you're welcome to name them aloud at this time if you'd like. Those named aloud and those embraced in our semi-silence <laughs> and all those who are suffering in our world and celebrating in our world, we hold in our community with compassion. And we now gratefully give and receive this morning's offering, which helps sustain this community and our mission to the larger world. Thank you, Maura. It was beautiful. It's now time for our story for all ages. So if anyone wants to come forward for the story for all ages. All right. I'm so glad. You can, you can run up. You can walk up. You can skate up like Max is skating on his, his shoes with wheels on them. I mean, that's brilliant. Here we go. Come on up. We promise. Okay, and, I, and by special request, I, I bought, brought a special friend with me today. As I usual do, usually do, but this is somebody we haven't seen for a little, little while. And here we go. There's Purple. There he is. So, so Max asked me uh, to, to, he says he's missed seeing you here, and, and he, uh, he wanted you to come today. So, so here you are. Hi, Max. Thanks for inviting me. Yes, people really. Is he a real? Yes, he's a real. He's a real puppet. <laughs> he's a real puppet. And that's Theo, who just asked if you were real. Hi, Theo. So Theo one time looked at a picture of you uh, with some of the other puppet friends at the house, and he said, "I like that guy. That that guy's funny." Hello, hello, Zuri. Hello, everyone. It's very good to have you. Purple is the first character I ever introduced this church to 11 years ago. In, well, it was July, uh, July 11 years ago. And we talked about, you talked about how shy you were about being around a new group of people, right? Yeah, but not so much anymore, right? Not anymore. Okay, well, anyway, it has been a while. So uh, how's your summer been? Lots of fun. Well, I'm glad to hear it. What did you do? Well, I earned money. You earned some money? Yes, helping at my parents' hotel. Oh, I, I didn't know your parents uh, have a hotel. Yeah, and, and one day some pirates came in 
and started talking about a nap that leads to a buried treasure. Oh, okay, pirates and a buried treasure. This is kind of suspicious. So then what? Well, then I took together a crew to help me sail to the island where the treasure is hidden. That story is starting to sound a little familiar to me, Purple. And I made friends with one of them. You did? Yeah, Long John Silver. <laughs> Long John Silver, okay. I think I know where this is going. But it turns out that he and the rest of the crew were planning on taking all the treasure for themselves and they took over our ship. What's that? You can ring the bell when I'm done. Yeah, it, it'll happen. It's gonna happen, it's gonna be a while. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, and then don't tell me after that, the, 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 the pirates followed you to the island and they took you hostage while they looked for the treasure. How did you know? Well, it's a lucky guess. Well, by then, a castaway who was on the island pretended to be a ghost and scared the pirates away. Oh, well, that's, that's interesting. So then what happened to the treasure? The treasure? Well, the treasure was given to a wicked sheriff. A wicked sheriff? I don't remember that part of the story. Yeah, so me and my dand of Nary Nen stole it back from him and gave the treasure to the people who needed it most. I see, you robbed from the rich and you gave to the poor. Then what happened? Well then, I, I followed a white rabbit down a hole <laughs> and ended up in a hundred acre wood where I met Winnie the Two and his friends. Well, that sounds like a lot of wonderful adventures this summer, Purple. And tell me, did you also happen to visit the library a few times? How did you know? Well, because it sounds like you checked out a lot of classic books like Treasure Island, Robin Hood, Alice in Wonderland, and maybe Winnie the Pooh. Yes, and, and now I'm reading Swiss Family Robinson. Swiss Family Robinson. Well, I'm impressed. Theo, Theo and I are both impressed with all the reading you're doing and that you spent some time this summer having adventures by reading a lot of great books. I'm sure Peggy, a reading teacher, really appreciates that too. Um, Anyway, uh, you, can, you, know, you can continue to read, I hope, this year. Are you looking forward to school starting next week? Are you guys looking forward to school starting next week? One person, two, two, three, all right, four, five, six, yay. All right, how about you, Purple? Are you going to? Okay, we kind of, we, I'm not buying the body language. But anyway, uh, maybe your teacher will pick some other great stories for you to read. And if not, you can always continue your adventures by reading what you want after you've done your homework, right? Okay, but right now I really need to go find out if the Robinson family gets off the island. Okay, well, great to see you, Purple. We hope you enjoy reading your books and have a great school year, everybody, okay? Yeah, thank you. Yes, you can give him a hug, and then we'll sing you guys out. Okay, you want to give him a hug? Sure, you can give him a hug. Purple loves hugs. You want touches? You know, you know that that is uh, that is actually a common response to puppets. Uh, it's called automatonophobia. It's actually it's actually a, a true thing, and some people get freaked out by puppets and and uh, mannequins and robots and those sort of things. So so perfectly understand. But it's nice that he was brave enough to come up and at least want to engage. But I don't want to touch it. <laughs> Thank you.
All right, I think you're up. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So I just learned a new style for ringing the gong. <laughs> try that a little bit later here. <laughs> for our uh, meditation today, uh, make yourself comfortable and uh, close your eyes, if you like, and breathe mindfully. Reflect on these words of author Ray Bradbury from his novel Fahrenheit 451. It doesn't matter what you do, as long as you change something from the way it was before you touched it, into something that's like you after you take your hands away. The difference between the man who just cuts lawns and a real gardener is in the touching. The lawn cutter might just as well not have been there at all. The gardener will be there a lifetime. Between 
my brothers and my sisters all over this land, over this land. Thank you so much, Pam. So during our most recent conversations with Todd Service on July 24th, not too long ago, uh, that's when I respond to a few random questions from church members. One of our members, Owen Muir, asked if instead of answering our questions, what question would you like to ask us? And none of us could have known that that would be Owen's final service with us, that he would die unexpectedly just a few days later. Or that his question would be the last thing that many of us would have heard him say. And what a great question it was to leave us with. Like his spirit, his final question lingers with us still. And I consider it the most brilliant bequest that he could have left us with. You may recall I had to pause a bit to consider that question, after which I finally asked, why are you here? And my question got a few chuckles, which I suspect was because after all the difficulties we've experienced during these past few years, some may have understood me to have been asking, why are you still here? <laughs> Dealing with conflict and adversity is never enjoyable, and some will choose to avoid it when they can. But others will, will choose to endure it because of what we gain by facing and overcoming our challenges. Some causes are worth the struggle. So yes, that is part of what I'm asking. What makes being here worth the struggle to you? But the question really has a lot more to do with the intrinsic nature of our church and Unitarian Universalism itself. After the illiberal and un-Unitarian behavior demonstrated by some of our former members in response to my unnecessarily controversial book, The Gadfly Papers, I've come to think that perhaps they weren't Unitarian Universalists to begin with, that they might have been here for some other reason. For ours is a liberal religion, rooted in the Enlightenment values of freedom, reason, and tolerance, which means that we accept our differences and meet them with compassion and curiosity. It means we cherish a free pulpit. And it certainly means that we don't condemn or ban book, condemn authors or ban books. And this is what our church, this is what our church has been about since it was established in Spokane in 1887. As someone who left the Southern Baptist faith, even though it was once an integral part of my life, I understand the necessity of leaving a religion if it no longer meets our needs, if we no longer believe in it, or above all, if it comes to contradict our own values. I sometimes say, let your values drive you from your religion before you let your religion drive you from your values. These past few years have been at least as hard on me as anyone else. The brood of vipers who have taken over the Unitarian Universalist Association and apparently hundreds of its illiberal ministers do not reflect my liberal values. And as recently as this summer, I had to endure being in a congregational meeting in which I was openly called a dictator and compared to Donald Trump. 
And there were a couple of attempts to change our bylaws so that I'd no longer have the authority to do my job. That's tough stuff. But hardest of all for me are those who think being pastoral means remaining in abusive relationships. Doing nothing and keeping my mouth shut about it. And that is not my idea of ministry, nor of being a good and healthy person, or in a good and healthy relationship. Why are you here? Why are you still here? These are questions I've been asking myself a lot. And I'm going to spend just a few minutes responding to them before opening the floor up to some of you, because I want to leave time to hear a bit of your answers. As for me, I'm going to move from the most mundane to the most important reasons for my being here. Firstly, to be quite honest, I need a paycheck. <laughs> Having recently been canceled, which is easy enough to discover in a routine Google search, I think most potential employers would be reluctant to hire me even if I wanted to find another kind of work. And having been excommunicated from the professional order of UU ministers, my career in ministry will end whenever I do leave this congregation. Another reason I'm still here is that I don't like bullies. I lived with an abusive bully the first 18 years of my life, and I have since learned not to let them push me or others around. Like Rocky Balboa, I may get the hell beat out of me, but my intention is to remain standing at the end of the bout. So here I stand. Here I continue speaking like Elizabeth Warren, I persist. Moving up the ladder, I'm also here because I'm still a Unitarian. Meaning the values I got in trouble for defending that's what that's all about. The values I got in trouble for defending in 2019 are still my values. In doing so, I started a denomination-wide conflict, and I don't know how it's going to end with a nationwide split or with us somehow reestablishing our liberal principles at the Unitarian Universalist Association, or with failure in the utter demise of liberal religion in America. So I'm here because preserving our liberal religion is worth the struggle. Finally, the top reason I'm still here is because of you. You have stood by me in difficult times. Come to my rescue. You came to my rescue. You've endured loss and continue to demonstrate your commitment to our liberal values through it all. I'm here because most of you also share and demonstrate those values that make ours a liberal religion. You have proven to those who mistook our church as merely a left-leaning social club or as a place where everything and anything goes and must be accepted or as a place with no meaningful history and no tradition and no core values, that we are a Unitarian Church and continue to stand as such just as we have done for 133 years. I thank you for that. I would not still be here were it not for you. And I remain here for you, because I worry what in this illiberal climate is going to happen to this historic congregation should I leave. And this does not mean that I will always be here. All good things must end. 
And I don't know what the near future or the far future holds for me, but for now, these are the reasons I'm here. Why are you here? So we're going to take a few minutes in our service to let some of you respond to that question. And here's a microphone. Tom, do you want to handle the microphone? Do you mind? That'd be great. We'll give Tom the first word since he's volunteering to, if, if, you, if you so choose. And then we have some friends online. And if you are interested in, in saying a word or two, just uh, if you can raise your hand, uh, if you know how to do that virtually. If not, wave. And if, if you guys see a hand up there and I don't notice it, would you, would you point it out to me? Not uncommonly, I do have something to say. <laughs> um, I came to this church in 1968, so I've been here a while. Um, I was a member and part of a young group of people in our late 20s, early 30s. And uh, to this day, many of us are still here. And over those more than half a century, we were part of what made this whole place work and function and enjoy each other and enjoy the spirituality and the community that was here. And to this day, that still is part of what keeps me coming back. And the other thing has been over the years, all the different ministers that we have had, and we've had a wide range of them, but I particularly have enjoyed the last 11 years here with Todd because every morning that I come here on Sunday mornings, I'm inspired to think differently and to be and I'm exposed to things that are things I would not have run into in my routine day of life. So I appreciate all of that. And um, this is a place for a thinking person and a person that wants to enjoy the community of others. Thank you. I, s I see one over here. Let me go over here. Uh, we're on. So Gordon Larson, uh, Gene and I have been members of this church almost 50 years. And it's pretty hard to follow Todd and Tom trying to formulate what I might want to say. Uh, I've been around a lot of different groups and professional associations and, and other things in my lifetime. But I absolutely, as Todd speaks of the values of this church, uh, again, 50 years later, it's the, the joy that I get coming to this community uh, every Sunday and uh, meeting and greeting you and meeting new people every day. It's, it's fantastic. So it's, it's where I want to be. Thanks. Thank you. Well, uh, I'm here because the loss of freedom of pulpit offends me to no end. That's one. The other is, uh, I was here for my wife the last year she was alive. And he came over at the drop of a pen to help her through difficult times at the end. I've never known any minister, anybody who could be so caring. And then, of course, he put my damn life on, <laughs> on, pay, on video or something. So how could I not want to be around this guy? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Don. I'm DJ Dan McClay. I came here in 1984 with my wife then. From San Francisco, we raised three kids here, and then she left in 99, and I stopped coming. I got the kids raised up, and I also started drinking. <laughs> so I got 12 years sober now, and I was sick for three years. I stopped doing everything because I couldn't think or talk. And a year and a half ago, I got out of my chair and figured out I had to change my diet. It was poisoning me. I'm a vegan now. Um, I went camping uh, last summer. I got a trailer to give me something to work for, a little trailer, and I was up in Newport camping. I met this... Uh, 
Matt Shea church member couple. Matt Shea's church, uh, On Fire Ministries. I went there a couple times, just curious. Not that I wanted to join, I just was curious. What's the energy? It's real, all that evangelical stuff. And Matt Shea, I wanted to hear his sermon. What's he about? I finally heard it, I immediately came here and rejoined. Because, oh my God, I can't, couldn't stand it. Christian nationalism, totally, and then some. Um, to me, the church was, to me, I think of the original, uh, the years I was here early on, uh, Bill Huff. He was the church for me. I mean, he just, his, his wonderful, wonderful ministry just was great. It, it spoke to me. So uh, when, um, our, when Todd came here, I really liked Todd. And I wasn't here for all of the controversy. I don't even understand it. All I know is he seems like the same guy to me, and I still like him. Why does everybody want to leave? We have a great church. Let's work through things. I don't understand it. So that's the way I see it. I wasn't here for the controversy. And I, you know, I believe in people working through things. So that's the way I see it. Thanks. Thank you. You had one behind you here, and then. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> well, good morning. I'm Dave, and uh, I really appreciate it. I'm relatively new to this congregation. And uh, my experience with uh, Unitarianism and w here with Todd is one of openness. And what, this, what I really appreciate my, in my own spiritual development. I need that. I need that ability to be open and be accepting of so many faiths, and this one in particular. And, uh, you know, I just, uh, I, I, I welcome the kind of people that are here and I welcome you know how we could be powerful in our community as individuals and I feel like this this is the place where I can be who I really want to be and uh, I didn't feel that way in other congregations in in other spiritual uh, my my ex-wife happens to be a Presbyterian minister by the way <laughs> And, and, and I love what she does. And uh, we're, we're still very good friends. But this is, you know, I'm, I'm new to, spirit, to Spokane. I'm new to this congregation. And what Todd's doing and what, we, what I want to be happening is exactly the same thing, which is being open to being who we are as a congregation and how we can be a part of the community. Thank you. Hi, I'm Christine Banker. Real close, okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Christine Banker, and I joined officially, I don't know when it was, September or something like that. One of the recent uh, membership, um, <coughs> officially becoming a member. I've been a lifelong Unitarian. My parents joined a Unitarian church back in when they merged, what was that, 62 or 63, when I was a babe in arms. And, uh, and so I've never gone to other churches as a, a member. I've visited, and um, I've moved around the country and belonged to four different Unitarian churches over the years. And so when I moved to Spokane a few years ago, I was looking for a home, if you will. And I came here. I met my friend Melissa. We actually met through a movie group we went to and found out we both were coming here. Um, and I asked her, because I was hearing there was this controversy that had happened before I started coming here, and she lent me the Gadfly papers and I read it. And it actually inspired me to become a, an official member as opposed to just coming each week. Um, I always think of myself as a Unitarian, no matter which Unitarian church I visit or go to. but. It really bothered me the, um, the issues of not letting our minister here have his voice and um, the idea of suppressing a voice because to me that is the opposite of what Unitarian Universalism is. And so I said, I'm not just going to come as a, as a visitor. I'm going to join because I want to show the support for Todd but also for this particular congregation for continuing through all of that and kind of holding firm and saying we're not going to be you know, pushed around and have our values changed. And so that's why I became a member. Thank you.
My name is Dan Akrit, and I'm here because I had no place else to go. <laughs> I found in the 70s, in the 1970s, that most churches I went to said, this is what we believe if you want to join, this is what you should believe. When I came to this church, or when actually I joined Cherry Hill, New Jersey, I found that we had a mix of people with different beliefs, different uh, intellectual, different backgrounds that could work together to do something that none of us could do as individuals. And that's one of the key reasons that I try and come every Sunday. I think it's so important for the different things that we do. The second thing I want to say is I was on the search committee for Todd. I felt then, and I feel now, that we have one of the finest ministers in the United States. We have somebody that will stand up for what's right and will not focus on just one point of view. He is looking at the history of the Unitarian Church, what it's accomplished, the various views that we all support, and I, I couldn't say more for what he's done for this church in the last seven years. Thank you, Dan. Uh, my name is Doug Deaton. I'm a newbie. Uh, and I just find, uh, I've just been coming since the beginning of the year, and, and I, I find this an oasis of sanity in a madding world. Uh, and I definitely come for the puppetry. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Kelsey. Hi, I'm Kelsey Gray, and we've been a member for about five years, and we're here for, I'm here for the community, and I see that Todd speaks truth and allows truth to be spoken and works for truth, and I think that's very important. Thank you. And, th and then after Owen, oh, Sue is up here, and then maybe we'll, we'll wrap up after Sue and let the, let the question be on. We'll give you the last word, yeah. Yeah, well, I keep finding people are saying the things I'm trying to think about already. That gets a little frustrating, but uh, it's, I go back to Bill Hoof as far as getting involved. I can't even remember when I officially joined, but a phrase that keeps popping up is uh, free thinkers. It's the name of a book I have at home, and we have the freedom to think here. We can disagree loudly, but we agree to think and to share those thoughts. I mean, I'm a little frustrated right now. I don't think Bill Hoof would cut the mustard with the current administration of the UUA and well I also need somebody to eat my bread and see how it works <laughs> Alan, Alan's a great bread baker and he gives me he gives, he gives me uh, loaves of bread to take home frequently so thank you Alan the last batch was wonderful by the way well Todd I'm still here because I want you to do my memorial service so I <laughs> I hope you'll hang out for a while because I don't plan on that happening anytime soon. No, truly, you, you do. Your memorial services are wonderful. I, I appreciate them so much. And uh, so I'm not entirely kidding about that. Be I became a Unitarian in the 60s because it, um, Unitarian values spoke to me. They still do, and I'm, I'm really sad that um, that the mother church seems to have moved away from those values, but I still have them, and I feel that the people in this room still have them, and so I'm going to hang out for a while, but not too soon, okay, Todd? Okay. <laughs> yeah, great. Wonderful last word. By the way, the reason my memorial services are so good is because I have great material to work with. <laughs> yeah. One more? Okay, one more. Oh, yeah.
One of the things that I'm thankful for is that you brought Peggy with you. Yes. Absolutely. And by the way, you know, I, I felt kind of selfish saying, you know, no, nobody has endured, you know, the trouble, the difficulties more than me because I should have really said than Peggy and I because she's, in, she's endured them just as much as I have, as you can imagine. So anyway, you guys have really helped us uh, find, uh, find a lot of strength and a lot of purpose and a lot of endurance and all those things that we need when we decide we're going to face life's difficulties. Because it's often a choice, right? Sometimes it's not, but in this case it was a choice. Somebody's got to do it, and, and I appreciate the fact that you have been there with us. So thank you all. Wonderful service. The question, why are you here, is ongoing. And it's not only why are you here in this church or why are you still here in this church, right? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's my philosopher friend Shane said, why are you here? You know, why are you here? You know, this is a broader question too, right? Why are we here? Why are we on this planet? Why are, why are, why are we embodied in, in, in biology so that we can do something? What are, what, what are we here to do? What's our purpose in life? What does life mean? Those big perennial questions. So it's a great question. And again, I want to uh, really honor, honor uh, Owen Mears' uh, memory by thanking him for asking uh, a question and dragging this one out of me. So I hope you'll continue to play with it. Thank you. Well, our final song of the day is from Gershwin. It's They Can't Take That Away From Me. And, and frankly, I picked this all for myself because I look out here and I've been here for quite a while, you know, over 30 years. So I see all those familiar faces and I am so glad to know at least a little bit about most of you and to learn uh, new things about newer people that come in. So I'm here because I like you. <laughs> so please stand and, and I'll sing this song to you and you sing it to each other. Uh, please stand. The way you wear your hat The way you sip your tea The memory of all that No, no, they can't take that away from me The way your smile just beams The way you sing off-key the way you haunt my dreams No, no, they can't take that away from me We may never, never meet again On the bumpy road of life Still I'll always, always keep the memory of The way you hold your knife The way we dance till three the way you changed my life No, no, they can't take that away from me benediction, I offer the words of the English philosopher John Stuart Mill. 
The amount of eccentricity in a society has generally been proportional to the amount of genius, mental vigor, and moral courage it contained. That so few now dare to be eccentric marks the chief danger of our time. Ooh. Amen. Blessed be. Salam alaikum and shalom.